Okay, so what we've got now is a bit of a panel discussion. So obviously I don't want to keep it too long because we don't want to sort of keep it too far from lunch. Um, but what I've done is obviously invited sort of some of the key speakers. Uh, we could have obviously invited lots more, but let's say it's not quite productive um, uh, to do that. Um, obviously we've been asking some sort of questions um, that have been sort of thrown up there, and I can see straight away it's had quite a few likes, and it's quite a, a quite a good question. Is what's the first thing you should do to start industry 4.0? But before we do that, if we just very very quickly, um, just give give us your sort of opinions, maybe just on that sort of point or any other uh, presentations that you've heard about. Um, so if we can sort of start with yourself, Andy. Um, the first thing I would say, if it's not a first thing, it's your first list. Um, first thing I think mean, somebody mentioned uh, the low hanging fruit, predictive maintenance, and things like this are so easy to do if you know that it's there to do. Um, somebody, I think you mentioned that you're uh, employing somebody in Ford to act as a business disruptor. I mean, we've seen this and been doing that for, for a few years ago in our Manchester office um, because everybody's busy, productivity is important, nobody's got time to sit and uh, ponder. You need a ponderer. But if you can base his, uh, his salary on the return of investment, what he does, then you can actually get a step change. But the main thing is to come up with a strategy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you know where you're going. I, I finished my presentation with a, with a, a, a why, not a how. You've got to understand you want better productivity, you want more uh, sustainability. Then work backwards and see what digitalization in the IR4 can do for you, not what, what you can do for it. Absolutely agree with, with everything that uh, Andrew said. <laughs> so, I was like, no, but, but I think it's important that we build on it because I, I think we'll have a common theme as we sort of go through all the things. You know, it, it, it is about understanding where you want to go as a business and how it affects different elements of your business. For me, a, a lot of us collect so, lots of data already, and one of the quickest returns is to use that data differently, or in some, many cases, to use that data. Um, as I touched on when I spoke, you know, it, we traditionally were using tools such as Excel and Minitab and other statistical tools, which take a lot of manipulating to get to the right data in the in the right format to be able to manipulate. Now we have tools, you know, for data mining like Altrix and ways of uh, displaying them, such as Tableau, and and they're arming our already engineering workforce and teams to be able to make smarter decisions and to be able to present them in a way which gives a business reason for doing something because, you know, funds are scarce and people are, people are careful and companies are careful with their cash. So we need to have a clear vision of what we're going to do, use the data we got and put the business justification together. But it's small steps. Okay, Roberto? Uh, I have not much more to add to that. They're both <laughs> correct in my opinion. It's hard enough. It should start with <laughs> <laughs> monitoring is one of the ways, the easiest ways, less risk ways to do it if you have like a uh, an application that you can monitor without affecting the actual production, for example, and start testing out technologies and maybe use that to convince uh, the company that it's something worth investing in. Uh, and that line, I would also highlight that it's very important to uh, get into the buy-in of, of the technology, that you actually, well, one of the managers are usually actually the easiest people to convince depending on the manager, of course. But in my experience, in our company at least, the managers are not the problem. The problems are the engineers. They don't want to change their practices. They've been using the same system for 20 years. And you're trying to tell them, but man, if I give you this, it's going to be easier. Like, no, but I need to learn a new system. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we need to start with, kind of trying to change the mentality Quite and make people a bit more flexible to, uh, to accept change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so with my information security hat on, um, I mean, the first place to start um, would be, and this, before you start adding to anything, because um, as Mark said, um, um, funds are scarce these days, um, understand what you have. So and what I mean by what you have is what technology does what and what data do you have. Not all of your data has to be protected. You only have to protect your crown jewels, really. Um, so understanding that, and then, you know, defending your systems correctly from that point. You could have gone to InfoSec this year. InfoSec is Europe's largest um, cybersecurity um, conference. You could have bought a firewall there 
the cheapest firewall was three hundred pounds. The lo the most expensive was thirty five thousand. Which one's right for you? Just because it's more expensive doesn't mean it's the right thing. So optimize your systems and your costs by understanding what you have and learning how to defend it. And then once you've done that, then move on to the next stages of evolving your network or revolving or whatever. I'd probably go back to my presentation and reiterate some of the points I, I made in there, particularly at the end, which is why are you doing this and what are you hoping to achieve? Um, and in order to, to take the next step, you really need to make sure you've got the connectivity in place in order to, to handle more data and make more sense of it. And uh, to be honest, without, without being cryptic, if, if I kind of put my ass on the line a bit, I'd say a good place to start is predictive maintenance. You know, there's, there's many facets to Industry 4, but I think the low-hanging fruit is, is probably predictive maintenance or condition-based maintenance. Great. And the final answer, which yeah, is thanks for that. Um, <laughs> I mean, everything that's been said, I totally agree with. I think from my point of view, going back to my presentation, is, is just maybe taking that step back and saying, what are we trying to achieve with Industry 4? Are we adding value by doing it, or are we doing it for the sake of doing it? You know, what is the problem that I'm trying to address by investing all this time and resource? And the only way you do that is by understanding where you are today, where your wastage is, and where you're adding value to your product. Once I think you've established all of that, everything that we've said here uh, collectively is equally applicable. But for me, the starting point is to know where you are today and what it is that you're trying to achieve and what problem you're trying to solve with. Perfectly said. Okay. So rather than me just going through each of the questions, obviously I have a microphone as well. So, you know, maybe from the sort of comments that have been sort of, uh, said so far, or maybe from what you've sort of seen out there, what are the sort of key points or questions that you'd sort of want to answer from uh, the suppliers or the providers of this type of technologies? <coughs> Please feel free to just put your hand up and ask any uh, questions or any other comments if you wish to make any. Can we start with anyone? Kevin Rowlands from the University of South Wales. Just picking up on the, on the last comment you made, which, which I totally agree with, um, if we take ourselves back 10, 15 years, um, the same question would have been asked. You'd have given the same answer, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so what's changed? What's different today? And why haven't we done all of these things over the last 10, 20 years? Because I remember when Robots came in in the 1980s, it was going to solve everything for us. We had Six Sigma, that was going to solve everything for us. And we were still asking the same questions and providing the same roadmap. Um, so what's, what's changed and are we going to get there or is it still going to be the same questions in 10 years' time? <coughs> I'll take that first, if that's okay. Um, I think you're absolutely right, we've said it. I think that there's two things really that have stopped this. One, historically, and it was in somebody's presentation actually, I think it might have been yours, that you know what we're talking about today, if your pockets were deep enough before and you got enough time, you could have implemented. Now, with the technology changes we've got, the connectivity, playing again to a lot of what's been said, the connectivity makes it so much easier to do this. It's no longer a battle changing between different languages, different operating systems. We have products that dare I say use the word plug and play, uh, but effectively products that can connect. The other thing that's been stopping this, and there's been a recent survey of a lot of SMEs in terms of what they feel is the barrier to them implementing some of this, and the thing that they came up with was people and the lack of creative skills within their teams to actually to be able to think about the implications of doing this and where it can take them. And of course, that's Industry 5. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Tim, I'll, I've got a question now. Yeah, I, w I just want to ask, um, with all the data moving to the cloud, so how do we um, get people that work in factories that are very conservative and that basically don't want to have their business secrets spilled out to the world? How do we uh, get them to the point that they understand that there are secure methods of um, storing data in the cloud and even sharing that data maybe 
securely between different parties. Um, how do, do we get that done? Because I think this is one of the, the most important problems that we have in Industry 4.0. Um, yeah, sharing data across businesses, sharing data across even factory plants. Um, how do we get that done? I think for horizontal integration, this is uh, necessary. This is one of the key points of Industry 4.0. Does anyone have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll give an opinion. Might be a bad question <laughs> or a hard yeah. question. It, it actually also relates to the other one, which is about cybersecurity threats. I know it talks about Nest and I. Mm. But maybe, that I suppose maybe, maybe I'll give an opinion from my perspective. And it's, it's about sharing the right data. And I, I think we get wrapped up in sharing, particularly when we talk about cloud technology, about sharing everything. It's not about sharing everything. Lots of the data we have is company confidential, company secret, is important to our own businesses. And, um, where I think there's an opportunity is even within an organization such as what how we share information internally. Because before we even started sharing more than what the build schedule is, what we require from our suppliers, what the customer wants, you know, we have to start sharing more internally. And we've got the data systems, we've got the networks to do it. But at the moment, we are our own business entity. We're all competing for work independently. And so, we have to be more open and share more collaboratively, and um, we're taking steps to address that through uh, an innovation workshop, sharing ideas. The, the latest thing, and I think picking up on one, one of the presentations, was how do we deal w with that data? You know, because it, it's more than just sharing it; it's how you share it effectively. So you pick the right data, you share it effectively. Um, and for us, we're doing something called Global Data Insight and Analytics. Plenty of acronyms. That's why Ford has a website called Ford Speak. So you can search all the acronyms. But what that primarily does is take all our different computer systems which aren't linked up and links them up in a, in a visual or uh, in a way that it can be interpreted and can be shared across the company. The key is selecting the right data. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I can't hype on about that enough. It's about picking the right data for the business and sharing it. Will we get total transparency across the supply base? No. My <coughs> personal opinion. Anybody else want to say? Yeah, I bought, yeah, yeah. So it goes back to exactly what you follow up on what you said. It's understanding your data, which is what I've said so many times already. Um, so before you share it, you'll understand um, what the impact of that data is. And then it's sharing it with other trusted networks. And that's the way, mm -hmm. the way you, you, you promote that trust is by having you know, um, a standard that you can you know that the company that you're sharing data with has the same standards as you, and that's probably the only way you're going to do it. Um, and as regards uh, Nest and Hive, yeah, they're brilliant, unless, right? So Hive were in trouble a, a while back because they were sending all your wireless data, including your, your wireless key in clear text over the internet, which was fine. Um, <laughs> and also, Nest is vulnerable to ransomware, which is fine as well, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, you just won't be able to turn your heating up. But what they do, what it does, is turns your heating up to 32 degrees and then locks you out until you pay a ransom in Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so, other than that, they're, they're all right. <laughs> but no, they're, they're, an example of, they're an example of devices that we plug in on our network and we don't realise the exposure they give. Because the best example is they punch a hole through your network out of the external and if, if you, you plug those devices in and without testing and without checking you're never going to know that they're really there and what impact they can have so they do cause a problem yeah. just, just sort of moving on to the other point which is now can we trust all this new data that's been generated so Siemens are giving us loads and loads and loads of data no and Siemens don't give you the data we, we, I think last year there was 40 zettabytes of data was stored of which 50% um, of the world's data was stored last year but 0.5% was used. So there's a lot of data there. I mean, I, one of my stupid analogies is, who uses a telephone directory or yellow pages? No, you go on the internet to do it. So the data's there. It's how you use it, and it's your choice. So what about the trust? What about the trust? The trust, well, okay, it goes back to Richard's um, um, question about data security. I mean, yeah. uh, well, I'll probably go off in the terms of it. Who uses a bank, and how, how many people have stuffed their mattresses full of tenants? Mm -hmm. Everybody uses a bank. Everybody trusts the bank security. We're just not translating that. So choosing the right bank for the data. Now, trusting the data is a lot of data currency. If you look at a car, 
it's got to be scaled, it's got to be managed, and that's where you get uh, new um, jobs like data, um, data scientists to actually manage the data and find out what is noise and what is meaningful mm. within the project of the University <coughs> of Huddersfield, covering a machine tool full of sensors to find out what is trustworthy, what is relevant, and what is just pure noise. Mm. So trusting the data depends on the source. Andy, from a festo point of view, I mean, you know, you, you, you sort of talked about all the sort of information that you've gathered as well, and of course you've been in the business for quite a, quite a while. But the, the trust of the data is now we're sort of seeing this sort of virtual information and so on. Who checks that that's actually the real data if it's coming across the world? If you're suddenly donning on your 3D helmet and sort of looking at something elsewhere, is that, how, how do you validate? I, I, I think, I mean, picking up on what Andy said, the first thing is to be to be clear about where that data is coming from and what that data is telling you. Once you understand what the data is, you can then you can start to look for exceptions. So you can look for where maybe data points are falling outside of what are acceptable norms. Or if you see you know you've had a trend for a while and something's moving away from that trend, you can start to flag up and have early intervention. That you know yes, there may be occasions where some of that data is spurious or it gives you a problem. But providing you've got that regular checking against you no know, references or you know what you consider to be a good data set, then you can actually start to identify where there is potentially rogue data coming into that. Um, using historical learning, you know, we've run a particular machine, a particular line for three years, and we know that our data sets always fall within this band, or we have this set progression of data. Something that falls outside of that then starts triggering alarms. It comes back to having people, the right people, that can actually look at that data and say, there is something wrong here. You know, this doesn't look right to me. Um, so there will be people checking the data to an extent. Mm -hmm. But again, selecting the right data with the right sample rates, so you're not creating reams and reams of the stuff, mm -hmm. then gives you that ability to look through and start to be able to build a better picture mm -hmm. about what that data is telling you. Yeah. Mark, do you have the people that can do that right now? Yeah. Um, it's, an ex it's an extension of what an engineer's role is. You, you take six sigma, six sigma, for instance. First thing you do when you try to solve a problem, and you, when you measure something, you do that measurement system analysis. You make sure that what you're measuring is correct, is capable. So data verification and continual confirmation is really, really important. But you have to have the people with the knowledge of the processes and the data to make those decisions. Okay. But it's it's about getting that data to a minute easier with less manipulation to make quick decisions. And are they coming through the system as well, through the schools? And so, the, the, uh, I can harp on all day about this. The, <laughs> my personal opinion, we have a problem coming. Uh, you know, we, and and we touched on it about data scientists. I think as a company, 40 employed 700 data scientists globally in the last sort of 18 months. <coughs> There's going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap in the technology. One of the L skip meetings was a training meeting. I, I heard an interesting stat taking a very core engineering subject of welding. There was four, 40 people sent, signed up to a welding course, but 2,000 signed up to hairdresser. We, 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 we know there's a gap. So, how do you make engineering STEM subjects interesting, sexy, appealing <coughs> to children? Yeah, because it has to start uh, before they pick their options in the year eight. I have a question about that. I don't quite know what the question is, but a comment, certainly a comment, a comment. To do more with, I think, I, the, the competency of someone, that I would say, in IT or in the background of IT, and they're, they're, I'm thinking more, if you go to get someone who, how, how do you, know that they are trained appropriately? How do you understand that they are capable of um, working in, you know, uh, I'm trying to think about it. But how do you really get capable, skilled people in IT that you can trust, that are trustworthy, and understand the processes in depth, both, you know, and I suppose it is con computer science, I guess, as a whole. I think the engineering is more sort of but I certainly think the computer science is a big issue, particularly with children. You know, I'm thinking the whole way through, and, and even yeah. this age, you know, where, do, where are the skills coming? How, where are the skills coming from? How do you get the skills? Yeah. How do you make sure that they are? You're right. There is a huge problem. There was a report out last week in England 
only 54% of secondary schools are offering a computer studies um, GCSE, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's supposed to be the, the, you know, the, techno the, the, the career for the future. And everybody, no matter what work you do, you're going to be working with computers. And we face it, we haven't had any figures at the moment, but I work in the ICT <laughs> so yeah. sector, and, and this is similar. We, we, we talked about that stat that you talked about, actually. And um, yeah, we, we see we have the same problem in Wales, we just don't have any figures at the moment. But in fairness, it's because it's taught so poorly. But, right, there, there are ways we're getting it's around it. Isn't it? It's yeah. like it can be taught so poorly, and you can have lots of people that claim to be whatever it is they claim you, to be you're right. doing, but how do you? But the steps they're taking, right, the steps they're taking, we've got in Wales, we're really lucky, we've got two academies. We've got the University of Cardiff have started the National Software Academy, which is giving students, so instead of a normal degree, it's a degree, except that it's done in a workplace. So they all work, like work in an office, and they work on real life <coughs> projects for businesses. So you could go to that company, go to Cardiff University, and ask them to build you a, an iPhone app. They'll build you an iPhone app. And they deal with the project, they manage the project, and they work the way through doing that. It's fantastic. So these students come out after their three years then, already understanding industry and how industry works. <coughs> I personally, I work with USW on the um, Cyber Academy. So they, they are operating the Cyber Academy in Newport as well. And um, that does exactly the same thing. So they work on projects with me, and I'll guide them through you know, exercises, and we work with real clients. So when they come out, straight away they work ready and they understand how to work. Because if they produce a, a report and it's a load of rubbish, it doesn't make any sense, they'll be told it's a load of rubbish, it doesn't make any sense. It's none of this, um, oh, they're students, it's all real world. So that's what we're trying to do in Wales, which is different to the rest of the UK. So which we understand it's a problem, but we are addressing it. Yeah. I was just going to say, on, on the competency bit, you know, it, it is an interesting conversation because, it, it, and again for me, it's about having someone at the right level of education with the right attitude. Mm -hmm. If they've got the right attitude and they've shown that ability to learn and they've got the right base knowledge in that subject, they will develop into very competent people. But it's very difficult, particularly in, in certain topics, IT for instance, how do you measure that competency effectively? I think the other side is whether you've taken people internally that you've already had and got them to do it, or whether you've gone looked outside. But, yeah. I, I think it's different for different yeah. sectors. So, you know, in a manufacturing environment, certainly what's absolutely makes sense to employ from within, to promote and employ from within. Okay. I've seen two scenarios within Siemens or Colton Factory. We've taken people from the apprentice school all the way to the shop floor and then plucked them and put them into an IT role. So they understood the production and then they applied that into. Industry four. I also heard that uh, somewhere in Airbus, somewhere, they're actually their disruptive IT team have come from IBM, and they've come in and said, "Why are you doing it that way?" And actually, been completely and utterly lateral of coming and thinking differently, not because they weren't really learning the problems of history. Yeah. So there are two different. Well, we, we certainly get this sort of cross-sectoral um, <coughs> sort of uh, uh, sort of crossover, and I think that really does does sort of play into it. And I think. Um, from, from your sort of side of it, Roberto, in terms of evolu evolution and evolution? How do, we, uh, how, do we, how do we make it happen? Well, make which part happen? The new word that you came up with. Ah, <laughs> evolution. Which is a combination well. of evolution. I mean, again, I mean, it, you know. I, I, going on, okay, I'm going to try and phrase this in a way that it's broad, according to, also related to what you were talking about right now. And, competence and knowledge and information. I've noticed that there's a lot of things, it's particularly manufacturing. You have a lot of know-how everywhere. You have the operator that's been operating the same machine for 20 years. He knows much more about the whole production line than any engineer that comes from a from an Ivy League university or whatever. But we do not make an effort to get information from them. And when you try to do it, there's a lot of resistance. They don't want to provide this information because they feel that they're going to lose their job or because they feel that they're going to become irrelevant or simply because the person that's asking is not asking the right questions or you have the wrong person asking the right questions. So that's one thing related to getting knowledge about these processes and modeling them in a way that you can make things relevant. When you were talking about predictive maintenance, about a way to go, that that's a good way to go into, into Industry 4.0, I agree. But if you want to put a predictive maintenance 
project or something on a machine, you need to know how the machine works. And you need to know, okay, if I get the sensor within these parameters or with this range, when is it going to become a problem? And that information is something that maybe the sensor guy says, oh, it's going to be this, but maybe the guy that operates the machine knows much more than you do. Mm -hmm. So there's a very big importance in trying to get that knowledge from that model in a way that is usable and then deploying it. And about trusting the cloud and trusting this, it's, it's kind of like, I would see it to, to make some kind of metaphor. Like, you think back 15, 20 years ago, credit cards on the internet, who used them? My dad never trusted it. He never, ever, ever, even to the day he died, used a credit card on a web page. But new generations are a bit more flexible. You just use it. So it's about using that. They think that it's not going to happen from one day to another. It's going to be very difficult with older generations. But if you, again, going to competence and education and getting kids when they're young and trying to tell them, OK, this is the way we're going. It's not going to be easy, but if you focus on these important pillars, security, uh, data sharing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the right data that we were talking about already, then it will become possible eventually to do this. And again, revolution, yes, 30, 40, 50 years from now, this is going to be thought as the fourth industrial revolution. But right now, it's an evolutionary, evolutionary process that is happening right now. It started already years ago. It's still ongoing. It's getting easier because it, the technology is making it easier. But it's an <coughs> ongoing process that we need to make sure goes in the right direction. Kind of like So before I sort of, because I'm also conscious of the time, because I'm sort of trying to catch up a bit of time. Um, obviously, is there any other sort of burning questions that people want to sort of quickly ask? Of course, you can have lots of lunch time. Uh, you know, we've got three quarters of an hour for lunch to keep pestering these people and asking these sorts of questions, hopefully. Um, and of course, make sure you sort of go and look at all the sort of uh, other areas as well. So have we got any sort of like final sort of questions or final sort of thoughts from this sort of panel? Anybody's happy. Yeah. Okay, oh, good, good. <laughs> oh, there's one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be a long question. So, <laughs> so if you read that and then answer that question over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, we, we talked about sort of closed close source and so on. Have we got any sort of general, I mean, if you feel like answering it, please feel so, do so. Or if you've got any sort of closing comments on what we've sort of seen. But what I'd like to know is, is industry, you know, is, is, is industry 4.0 here right now, as we sort of said always in the future? Should we be adopting it? Could we trust it? Or it's already sort of gone and, and we should be looking at industry <coughs> five? Any, I went to uh, the EMO exhibition about uh, two months ago, the big machine tool exhibition in Hanover. And it was uh, wall to wall industry four, uh, you know, the pencils were industry four, the toilets were industry four. About a month ago, I went to the PPMA show, which is the equivalent of packaging and plastics, not mentioned. However, the whole point of the industry, the fourth industrial revolution is, now all of the internet connection gives the capability to the low end, low price value side of the market. It's not been adopted. So food and beverage, chemicals and pharmaceuticals, that's where the benefit could be made. But they're still thinking automotive and aerospace. We need to take the technology and then take it to these other industries that can Perfect. But some of that technology, I mean, it happens to be open source, or could, could you trust it, or would you sort of like say, well, no, no, it's going to be a single solution, or a festival solution? No, I'm answer very quickly that mine's very question is, it's an open platform that anybody can sign up to. Anybody who does a closed platform in, in, uh, in history has failed because nobody else can use it. It's an open platform that anybody can log into. Cool. Well, maybe Andy, can you sort of thoughts? Yeah, whether is industry for here, yes or no, certainly the technologies to implement the kind of benefits that we're talking about is here. But then equally, we've just had questions about how do we get the right people. Um, you know, I think with a lot of smaller manufacturers, I mean, people like Ford, obviously, there's a lot of money invested in production and manufacturing. It's, you know, it's not done lightly. Smaller machine builders, smaller SMEs are probably more focused on getting products out the door. Um, and you know, they probably don't even really have any concept or a vision as to what Industry 4 could offer them. Uh, so it's, it's like most of these things, you know, we are still on the very leading edge 
in terms of not necessarily the technologies themselves, technologies that we say have been around for a while, but connecting in such a way that we have this theme of industry four. We're very much on a leading edge. So there's still a lot of education to be done with a lot of smaller manufacturers. Um, you know, how do we know we've recruited the right people? The question I would ask is, do we even know what we want those people to be yeah. doing? Um, and I think in a lot of cases, the answer to that is probably no. That's a great, great point to stop on. So a nice round of applause for our panel.